Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number six, ready for teaching on May 6. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and our lesson title this week is The Hour of His Judgment. Sabbath afternoon, April 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue with this series of studies on the three angels' messages, we thank you for what they bring to us about how you are God the Creator, about how you provide salvation for us, and how that we have a message to take to the world. Lord, people are listening to this podcast all over the world. Whether they're listening in Dubbo in New South Wales or Brisbane in Queensland, I'd like to pray for every person who is listening. And today I'd like to pray for Jay Wynne from Massachusetts and Alan Jean Joseph from Haiti and Armado from San Francisco or Amanda from Newcastle in South Africa or Bruce from Victoria in British Columbia or Farouk from Trinidad or Elaine from Arkansas or Charles and Christina from Beechmere. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to guide us, that our hearts may be blessed, that our minds may be clear, and that our salvation may become just so apparent that we grasp it with both hands and thank Jesus for what he did for us. We pray now that your word as it goes around the world may be a light that will draw people to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let's read that again, Romans 13, verse 11. 11 and 12. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Several years ago, National Geographic magazine described a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. After it ended, forest rangers trekked up a mountain to assess the damage. One ranger found a bird literally burned to ashes at the base of a tree. Somewhat sickened by the eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. When he struck it, three tiny baby birds scurried from under their dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings. She could have flown to safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. What a picture of the believer who is safe in Christ. The fires of God's judgment burned themselves out on him at Calvary. And all who are in Christ are safe forever beneath his wings. At the cross, Christ was judged as a condemned sinner, so that we could be judged as righteous citizens of the heavenly kingdom. He was judged as a criminal so that we could be set free from the destructive fires of eternal loss, both figuratively and, yes, literally as well. Sunday, April 30, The Cleansing of the Sanctuary As we have already seen, there must be a judgment before Christ comes. The angel announces in a loud voice that the hour of his judgment has come in Revelation 14 verse 7. The book of Daniel gives us the time when this judgment begins. Read Daniel 8 verse 14. What specific timetable does Daniel give us regarding the cleansing of the sanctuary? Daniel 8 verse 14. And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Each Jew understood clearly the meaning of the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. It occurred on the Day of Atonement, which was the Day of Judgment. Although Daniel understood the concept of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment, he was confused about the 2,300 days. 
Read Daniel 8, verse 27, and Daniel 9, verses 21 and 22. What was Daniel's response to the vision of the 2,300 days, and what was God's response to him? Daniel 8, verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days afterward. I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. And 9, beginning at verse 21, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the end of Daniel 8, Daniel fainted and later exclaimed in verse 27, I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. That is, the vision of the 2,300 days. The rest of the vision already had been explained, as we see in Daniel 8, verses 19 to 22. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. The next chapter, Daniel 9, records the angel Gabriel coming to explain to Daniel the 2300 day prophecy. In Daniel 9.22, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Gabriel amazes Daniel as he reveals an answer to his prayer much broader than he ever imagined. The angel Gabriel took Daniel down the stream of time and revealed the truth about the coming Messiah, giving the exact dates of the beginning of his ministry and his cruel death, events that tied directly to the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8. In other words, Christ's death and the judgment are inseparably linked. And so to finish the day. Why is it significant that the death of Jesus, as revealed in Daniel 9, 24-27, is directly linked to the judgment in Daniel 8, 14? What great truth is taught here by this link? Daniel 9, beginning at verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And Daniel 8 verse 14, And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Monday, May 1, the 2,300 days and the end time. Read Daniel chapter 8, verses 17, 19 and 26. What time period does the angel declare that the vision of Daniel 8 and the 2,300 days apply to? 
And why is that important to understand? Daniel 8 verse 17, So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And then verse 19, And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. And verse 26, And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Some argue that the 2,300 days are literal days. They also believe that this little horn of Daniel 8 applies to the Seleucid military leader Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived from 216 BC to 164 BC, who attacked Jerusalem and defiled the Jewish temple, even though 2,300 days does not fit even his time frame. This interpretation, however, is contrary to the angel's clear instruction that the vision applies to the time of the end. Antiochus Epiphanes certainly did not live at the time of the end. In Daniel 8, Gabriel begins his explanation of the 2,300-day prophecy. He names the ram as representing Medo-Persia and the male goat as representing Greece. In Daniel 8, verses 20 and 21, The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Though not named, as are the two powers before it, the next entity, the little horn, is obviously Rome. And we see clues in Daniel 8, verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And verses 23 and 24, And in the latter time of this kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, have fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. He then depicts a kind of religio-political phase of Rome which would cast down the truth to the ground, as we read in Daniel 8, verses 10 to 12. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. And verse 25 through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And interfere with Christ's heavenly ministry, we read in the text here in Daniel 8 verses 10 to 12, which we've already just read. The cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14, the climax of the chapter, is God's answer to the challenge of earthly and religious powers that have attempted to usurp the authority of God. It is part of God's divine solution to the sin problem. Gabriel is ready to explain the details in God's prophetic timetable. At the end of Daniel 8, we can clearly see that Daniel did not understand the part of the vision about the 2,300 days, as we read in verse 27 of Daniel 8. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. The earlier part about the ram, the goat and the little horn had all been explained, even with the first two powers outright identified by name. 
in Daniel 8, 21 and 22, which we've just read. The cleansing of the sanctuary was, however, not explained. The angel Gabriel, who appeared in Daniel 8, appears now in Daniel 9 and says to him, in verse 23, At the beginning of your supplications the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. What vision? As we will see tomorrow, it is the vision of the 2,300 days, the only part of the previous vision in Daniel 8 that he hadn't explained yet to Daniel. And so to finish the day... Gabriel called Daniel greatly beloved, what does that tell us about the intimate link between heaven and earth? Tuesday, May 2, the angel's instruction to Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. What specific instruction does the angel give to Daniel? Why is this significant in understanding the meaning of the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14? Daniel 9.23 begins, At the beginning of your supplications the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. The angel plainly instructed Daniel to consider the matter and understand the vision. What matter and what vision? Because there is no vision recorded in Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel must be speaking of the portion of the vision in Daniel 8 that the prophet did not understand, the vision of the 2,300 days. Daniel 8.14 said, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Gabriel continues in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, What events in the life and ministry of Jesus is this about? Daniel 9, beginning at verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary." and the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate." The first portion of the prophecy relates to God's people, the Jews. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, the Jewish nation, in Daniel 9 verse 24. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal prophetic year, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid it on you a day for each year. And also we see this in Numbers 14, verse 34. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days. For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. In Daniel and Revelation, when you have symbolic imagery, you usually have a symbolic time prophecy as well. One of the ways we can be certain that the day-year principle of prophecy applies here is that when we use it in Daniel's prophecy, each event on the timeline comes out prophetically. And we'll see that in tomorrow's lesson. 
If we apply this principle, 70 weeks are composed of 490 days. Since one prophetic day equals one literal year, 490 days are 490 literal years. Gabriel tells Daniel that 490 years are cut off. The literal meaning of the Hebrew word chathak, C-H-A-T-H-A-K, is sometimes translated determined. Cut off from what? It only could be the other time prophecy alluded to here, the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14. These 490 years, which are a time prophecy, are directly linked back to the time prophecy of Daniel 8.14, the only part of the vision left unexplained in Daniel 8, and the only time prophecy in Daniel 8 as well. Thus, we can see that Gabriel, with this time prophecy, is coming to help Daniel understand what he didn't understand in the previous chapters, the 2,300 days. Wednesday, May 3, the Messiah cut off. Gabriel began this 490-year prophecy with an event that was extremely important to Daniel and to the Jews, the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Though various decrees had been passed regarding Jerusalem in Ezra 7, we discover that the decree passed in 457 BC allowed the Jews not only to return to their homeland but also to establish themselves as a religious community. As we read in Ezra 7, verse 13, I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. It is significant to note that the Artaxerxes decree was issued in the autumn of 457 BC. From this decree in 457 BC to the Messiah, according to Daniel, would be 69 weeks or 483 years. If we begin at 457 BC and move forward on history's timeline, we arrive at AD 27. The word Messiah means the Anointed One. In AD 27, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was baptized, as we read in Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Daniel predicted hundreds of years in advance the exact year for the baptism of Christ, the time at which Jesus would begin his three and a half years of ministry. Read Romans 5, verses 6 to 9, along with Daniel 9, 26. What great truths are revealed here? First we'll read Daniel 9, 26. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of war, desolations are determined. Romans 5, beginning at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, it said in Daniel 9.26. 
the Messiah would be cut off or crucified. The verse adds, but not for himself. In other words, the death of Christ on Calvary's cross was for us, not for himself, which is why Paul could write in verse 8 of chapter 5 in Romans, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Daniel 9.27, we read that in the middle of the week, the last seven years, Christ would bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In the middle of his 70th week, in AD 31, Christ confirmed the everlasting covenant with his blood by dying on the cross, and the sacrificial system lost any and all prophetic significance. These prophecies reveal that Christ, the Messiah, would be crucified and cause the sacrificial system to cease its prophetic importance in the spring of AD 31. These predictions were fulfilled in every detail. Exactly at Passover, when the high priest was offering the Passover lamb, Christ was sacrificed for us. And so to finish the day, with what has been written about in mind, read Mark 15.38 and Matthew 3. 15 and 16. How do these verses help us understand the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27? Mark 15 and verse 38. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew 3, beginning at verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And so once again we read Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Thursday, May 4, the year 1844. The first 490 years of the 2,300-year prophecy were designated especially for the Jewish nation of antiquity and the coming of the Messiah. The last part of the 2,300 years has to do with God's people, both Jew and Gentile, along with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and ultimately the second coming of Christ. The first 490 years applied to the first advent of the Messiah and ended in AD 34. Subtracting 490 years from 2,300 years leaves us with 1,810 years. These second 1810 years apply to God's people. If we begin at AD 34 and we add 1810, we come to AD 1844. In light of the cleansing or restoration of the truth about the sanctuary and heaven's end-time judgment, God makes his final appeal to all humanity in Revelation 14, 6 and 7 to respond to his love, accept his grace and live godly, obedient lives. Revelation 14, 
beginning at verse 6, Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Read Leviticus 16.16. What was the reason for the cleansing of the sanctuary? And what does this teach us about the gospel? Leviticus 16.16. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Because of the people's sins, the people's iniquities, the sanctuary had to be cleansed, which happened only with the blood of animals. It's the same with us. We need a saviour whose life is symbolised by the animals slain on the Day of Atonement as the only way to make it through the judgment. Read Leviticus 23, 26-29. What did God command his people to do on that Day of Judgment? And what should that mean for us Today, Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. The Israelites were to afflict their souls. This expression indicates that they were to humble themselves and to examine their hearts, confess their sins, repent, and ask God to cleanse them as the high priest was cleansing the earthly sanctuary. And so to finish today, The prophetic chapters of Daniel 7 through to Channel 9 and Revelation 14 focus especially on the Judgment Hour urgent appeals to prepare. Since 1844, we have been living in the Judgment Hour and Revelation's message of the first angel proclaims the hour of his judgment has come in Revelation 14 verse 7. How then do we today afflict our souls? Friday, May 5. Here's a quick and easy way to look at the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9 24 to 27. First, there are the 70 weeks in verse 24. Next, there are the 7 weeks and 62 weeks or 69 weeks of verse 25 of the 70 weeks. There's the last week, the 70th week in verse 27. And finally, that last week is divided in the middle of the week in verse 27 into two three and a half year sections. That's it. 70 weeks, which are composed of 69 weeks and one week, and that one week is divided in half. Just plug in the date 457 BC, see at the beginning, and with simple math, yes, we come to 1844 on the timeline. Also, in describing the 2,300 days, Daniel 8 never said when the 2,300 days began. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, it said in Daniel 8.14. Unto 2,300 days, from what time? Why not from the time when Daniel had the vision itself, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar in Daniel 8 verse 1? That doesn't work. The vision in Daniel 8 didn't include Babylon. It started with kingdoms after it, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, up to the end. Why date an event? The cleansing of the sanctuary, which is in the vision, from an event, the reign of the kingdom of Babylon, which is not? The starting date for the climax of the vision should come from within the vision itself, which started with Medo-Persia and extends to the end. That's a lot of years. Which one began it? We are not told in Daniel 8. We are told in Daniel 9.
And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, in class, discuss the close relationship between the gospel and judgment as seen in these two parts of what is really one prophecy. Why is the link between the two such good news for us? How should this link help alleviate the fear that many have had regarding the idea of judgment? Two, dwell more on the truth revealed in Daniel 9.26 that the Messiah was cut off but not for himself. What is this about? For whom was he cut off and why? And three, Read again Leviticus 16.16 and Leviticus 23.26-29. Talk about the reason for the cleansing of the sanctuary in Leviticus 16.16 and how the people were supposed to act when it happened in chapter 23 verses 26-29. What is the relationship between what happened then and what it should mean for us today? Leviticus 16.16 So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions, for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And chapter 23 of Leviticus, beginning at verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And so the question remains, what is the relationship between what happened then and what it should mean for us today? And now for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Ukrainian Miracle by Andrew McChesney Ten-year-old Anna struggled in his classes amid an ongoing torrent of bullying in public school in Odessa, Ukraine. His skin was darker than the other children's and his classmates made fun of him. He lived with his Ukrainian grandmother after being left at her home by his mother, a former Seventh-day Adventist. His father wasn't a Christian and lived far away in Iran. Grandmother didn't like the way that Annas was being treated at school. Upset over the bullying, she finally transferred the boy to the local Seventh-day Adventist school. At first, Annas was withdrawn and spoke little, but he loved the Bible classes so much that he tried to remember the teacher's words by whispering them as he heard them in the classroom. As the days and weeks passed, he began to open up and make jokes. The other children enjoyed his wit, and he soon became the class clown. He received his very own Bible. His mother was furious when she learned that Annas was attending the Adventist school, and she took him away from Grandmother to live with her. She refused to speak with Grandmother, and she taught Annas at home. Grandmother prayed for God to intervene. She prayed every day for a year. After some time, Mother began speaking to her again, and they became friends again. One day, Mother agreed to Grandmother's suggestion to meet with an Adventist pastor. Annas listened to the conversation, and he learned his surprise that three of his friends from the Adventist school were going to be baptised. I also want to be baptised, he exclaimed. Mother was surprised. The pastor was surprised. They asked Annas some questions. It turned out that he had been studying the Bible on his own during the year that he had been living with Mother. More than anything, he wanted to be baptised. His fervent desire to give his life to Jesus touched Mother's heart. She gave her consent. Two weeks later, Mother and Grandmother watched as the 11-year-old boy was baptised with his three friends from the Adventist school. It was a miracle facilitated by God and Adventist education said Ivan Rapalov, Education Director for the Euro-Asian Division, whose territory includes Ukraine. There was not only a reconciliation of the family, but also a reconciliation with God, he said. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that support Seventh-day Adventist education around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. 
My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.